three. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be able to share with you today. Um, and if you got on the call with us early, you know I am not taking this too seriously, even though this is a very serious topic uh, and it's very near and dear to my heart. I've been at Louisiana College uh, this year, I just made one year, as the activity director and their distance learning coordinator. Uh, I came here to start a, a Title III project grant to start an online program. And it was very appropriate. They needed someone as soon as COVID hit because then everybody was online, whether they wanted to be or not. So uh, the topic that I wanted to cover with you guys today is communication during a long-term crisis, identifying how administrators can provide biblical encouragement to faculty and staff. Uh, my background is communication, even though I, I'm an associate professor of business. Um, I still have a lot of communication hours in looking at how communication interacts with business leadership and definitely in the educational space. As we create online courses, um, we talk a lot about how faculty engage with students. We don't always talk a lot about how administrators also need to biblically encourage their faculty and staff. So I looked at the research that was done in 2010 and then reiterated in 2014 by uh, A.J. Zaremba. I might be butchering his name, but I'm sorry, um, on crisis communication theory and practice. And this is built on the thought process that communication in a crisis is usually short term. We have short term crises. I think after COVID, we're going to see a lot of new research come out that talks about long term crisis. Um, uh, we haven't really faced this since the flu pandemic, uh, I think maybe 100 years ago as a nation and as a world. Um, but this crisis communication talks about crises are inevitable. Um, in most cases, the best option is to choose transparent and honest communication uh, to be effective. And I think as Christians and, and as Christian leaders and educators, we would say, yes, this is what we do. We follow the golden rule. Uh, we want to make sure our organizational culture um, has a positive impact, especially in a time of crisis. And uh, he says also that crisis communication requires training and skill sets, even to bright executives um, that may not have those. And this is all based off of uh, the business world. Uh, I didn't find much research in the educational world built around this topic, but like I said, I think that will be forthcoming as we move through uh, this pandemic and looking into the next few years as research develops. So he goes on to say um, his hypothesis is that crisis is gonna happen. We should really just accept and be prepared. He says that organizations that are profitable and well-managed will always encounter sudden problems. Um, and I think we could say this affects higher education as we think about enrollment. Um, as elections affect enrollment, uh, as job uh, markets, it also really, really impact our enrollment. Um, he says that crisis requires communications with various audience. And I think a key there is not only that they're variant, but that we have to know who those audiences are that we're communicating with. Because if we think about our faculty and staff, they come from different backgrounds, maybe different faith backgrounds, different life issues and situations. And so we can't just really communicate as, as one blanket statement, but really how do we connect with them on an individual basis? He says also that the quality of the communication is crucial for success and sloppy communication during a crisis can plague an organization. Without thinking too hard or talking about our nation, can we see how sloppy communication has it had an impact in the last few months? Maybe not answer that out loud, but maybe just think about that. <laughs> um, so that's those are the things I was thinking about. And I said, well, okay, let's find some definitions. How do we define crisis? Um, and I found this on the Harvard Business website. And they said routine crisis is something that um, it's, it's already been faced. Somebody's already faced it. We're used to this. It happens. We have some type of a plan. I know most schools have a continuing operation plan. Businesses, of course, have that. Uh, 
similar things have occurred somewhere else. So maybe my school hasn't experienced it, but your school has. There's a knowledge base that exists and we can pull from each other. On the other hand, unprecedented crisis, and this is a new definition, it's new. We've never faced it before. We're not sure where to start. Uh, many of the, the leaders maybe in the organization have competing priorities. Uh, even some of our constituents have competing priorities. Um, there's an unknown future, an unknown timeline, and it takes teams of people to find solutions. And I feel like we're really in this unprecedented crisis category. And to me, it felt like, okay, this is a way I can define where we are. Um, this is a way I can look at how do we start finding solutions. And I think it's, it's places like Cahia where we get together teams of people and, and find those solutions, which is one of my favorite things I love about Cahia. It's a place for practical application and sharing of ideas. So where does this leave our, our academic admins? Um, this is his communication theory framework. Um, and I, I kind of like that he has it in a circular motion. It's ongoing. Communication needs to be regular and unified. Communication needs to be honest and offer hope. And in that, I said, we use scripture. We have scripture as our hope. Uh, the golden rule on how to treat people, again, is another biblical concept. Uh, organizational culture matters. And I think in time of crisis, it's really good to keep communicating what that organizational culture is and maybe even tweaking it to really define who we are as an institution. But changing culture too drastically can also have negative impact. Um, communication training is critical, which is why we have webinars like this, why we do um, team meetings, why we get together and why we share ideas. So from a biblical perspective, I really started praying about this. And I said, okay, God, how, what does the word say about this? How, did, how should we approach this from a Christian perspective? And I'm not a biblical scholar, so bear with me. But these are the scriptures that really spoke with me. Um, Proverbs 29, 18 specifically, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I think growing up, I always thought, well, the people just die. But I think in this instinct is they lose hope. They lose vision they lose a goal that they can work towards. And so that word perish in this instance feels more like a depression or a decay, or maybe it can feel like isolation. Um, but he says, he that keepeth the law, which has a vision, he is happy because we have a hope. We know the end goal. We know that God has won the battle for us. The next scripture is Hab Habakkuk 2.2. So the Lord answered me and he told me, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. And so I think it's important for us as administrators to continue to write down, what is our vision? How do we encourage our people to keep moving forward and not become stagnant where they are? So we have to, I know we have strategic plans, but how do we give that intangible everyday uh, bits and pieces so that we can keep encouraging people to move forward. So write it down, maybe an email, maybe, uh, especially since we're all virtual, can we host like a town hall meeting or a monthly meet and greet where people feel it's a safe space to share ideas on how we're moving towards that vision. And then 1 Timothy 5.1, it says, do not rebuke an old man, but encourage him as you would a father and young men as brothers and older women as mothers and younger women as sisters in all purity. And to me, that really struck a chord, encouragement. What is the one thing we've really needed in this time of political unrest and COVID and insecurity and unsurety? It's really the biblical encouragement that comes from us being together. And how do we do that when we can't be together? So I thought about what are some biblical references of where we see this walked out uh, from a leadership perspective. And I, I thought about Queen Esther. She gets advice from Mordecai before facing the king. And I think that it fits in the unprecedented category because she had never faced a king before. And the rules were that if you went before the king unannounced, the penalty was death. And that's a very strong penalty. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't faced that before as a leader <laughs> to have to go before someone. Um, but the, the issue that was facing the Jewish race 
was one that they had faced before. They had faced annihilation. They had faced being imprisoned. They had faced that before, but Esther as a leader needed to be able to communicate. And so she goes to Mordecai and gets that advice. What do I do? And Mordecai says, pray. And I'm gonna get everybody that I know to pray. And I thought, that's great. That's what Kahia is. It's our group of people that pray and get advice that we can share. Um, because Haman had sent this edict to every part of the region. And doesn't that feel really familiar right now that every part of the region seems to be against us as a Christian higher education community? Um, it seems like there's a lot that we're facing. Um, so Mordecai gives her the advice and she shares the plot against the king. And the king saves Mordecai's life. And the king is very aware of what Esther has done. But look at this. Mordecai cannot tell Esther step by step, but he says, we will fast and pray and God will open the way. And he did. Um, so that was my first example. My second example was Ruth gets advice from Naomi before gleaming and going to Boaz. And I think about this as Ruth is coming to Naomi from somebody who is a different uh, religion. Uh, so there's some diversity issues there. There's some cultural differences there. Even though they were related and had gone through some of the same issues, uh, Ruth doesn't know how to act in, a, in, a, in this foreign land. And their family is, is, is facing extreme poverty. Their husbands have died, so they have no support. And Ruth is facing excommunication in this new land that she had followed Naomi into. And so I think a lot of people sometimes feel like they're in a place where they're, they're facing uncertainties. And how can we as academic leaders help them not feel exiled? I know we've, we've been focusing a lot on diversity this month as Black History Month of how do we help our faculty that are minorities or of different ethnicities feel welcomed in our space and understand the culture and understand the practices that we do that we take for granted as being normal, but it, maybe it's something they've never experienced before. So Naomi gives Ruth the advice to go glean. She gives her the advice of how to get the attention of Boaz because Naomi knew the culture. She understood it. She understood the protocols. Um, and Naomi prayed and believed that Boaz would be their redeemer. And I think this is interesting uh, of looking for that sense of having a redeemer, having a champion, having that encouragement that you're not alone. And I think this is a beautiful story of how we can welcome in our diverse minority faculty and our diverse minority students of giving them some biblical advice and wisdom as they go through the process. I know a lot of our international students are facing isolation from family. Some of them haven't been able to return to the states to continue their education. So they feel isolated from their friends, their teammates, their coaches. So what are some ways that we can help encourage faculty to reach out to them and think about the situation that they're in? And then the last one I have, this is young David. He goes to King Saul for advice before facing Goliath. Uh, the country had been in crisis for 40 days. The giant was taunting everyone in the land and no one was willing to face that giant. And here comes young David looking for advice from the king. He said, I'll go before him. And so King Saul as a leader says, well, the only way I know to tell you is to do it the way I know to do it, is to wear my armor, which doesn't fit, and it's cumbersome. And David says, I can't do it the way you did it as a leader. I have experiences. I've killed the lion. I've killed the bear. I have experiences that you as the king haven't had. So how can we as leaders look to our faculty and staff and find out what are their experiences that they can bring to the conversation on how to face some of the trials and issues they're facing? Because maybe they have the tools and the insight that we haven't faced. They face the experience in a different way. So these are some practical applications of pulling these two things together from research and biblical perspective. Um, Schedule some time to do some, some direct communication. We talked about that unified communication. 
Um, we also talked about up-down communication and down-up communication. Uh, so maybe an online meeting, recording messages that go out frequently that have some specific encouragement and information of what's coming up next, and regular briefings for, for staff and for faculty. I think regular communication gives somebody, they said, well, maybe I don't know what's going on right now, but I know every Monday I'm going to get an update or once a month, I'm gonna get an update. I know what to look forward to. That scheduled communication creates a certainty that they can anchor their time in. And having that anchor helps them feel like they're not just wondering when they're gonna hear something or what's the next thing that's gonna happen. Um, the next thing is to create a space for support, maybe to share scriptures, send um, prayers of support to one another. Uh, one of the things we're encouraging our faculty to do this year is do in uh, prayer walks, walk around campus, pray for the faculty, pray for the students, jo ask the students to join you in a prayer walk. Uh, we have a couple of different ways and we have some specific things we're praying for. Um, and we have a really beautiful green space uh, where people can walk. Um, so that was one idea. Another is create trainings. Uh, the research shows that you People need to be trained frequently and often. Um, so there's TED Talk, TED Talk style trainings that you could think about doing. Some of the things like we're doing with the Kihia, if you do a lunch and learn, maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and ask your faculty to share their tips. They're the front line. I mean, they're in the classroom, they're online, they're in Zoom. Um, sometimes they're teaching to a lot of blank screens, which can be really frustrating. Um, and really hard because you're not getting that feedback and engagement as a faculty. Uh, so you're not sure what do I do differently or how do I get them to engage? And it could be something as simple as using emojis. Get everybody to sign in using an emoji. What is your emoji for today? I have another faculty member, she asked them to sign in. What's your, um, your mood of the day using a cat image? So everybody logs in with a different cat image. And there's a lot of these on, on different websites. Uh, so I thought those were really interesting. I'm not sure I would log in as a cat emoji or <laughs> a cat mood. <laughs> I'm not sure what that would look like. But something that gets students thinking about how to engage, to turn their screen on, to be a part of the conversation. Uh, and also give examples, how to best address students, parents, and the media when you're talking about communication. Because I know it's easy to go negative really quickly but a lot of people are listening when you're talking, even to other faculty or through email. Emails can be forwarded so easily. So a message is really easily to get um, sent on with maybe not the whole concept of the situation or the whole, the whole picture. And then respond to issues with faith uh, is my last piece of advice here. Uh, support faith with action. I, I'm really strong in this, and I've learned this from the mentors that I've, I've had the, the privilege of serving under, is if you say you're going to pray, follow up. How'd it go? How are they feeling? Are they over COVID? Are they feeling better? Send them a card. Just check in with them. Even the smallest acts of kindness, supporting that faith uh, gives them a model to follow. And it goes a long way to check on faculty members that are extremely stressed out right now. So uh, one of the things I did this, this semester is we, at finals week, we created little baggies. I have one here. It's just a simple little Ziploc bag full of candy. And we put a sticker on it that said, these are your survival packs. And they came with candy, chocolate, some kind of mint. And I put K-cups uh, because I know a lot of people are coffee or tea drinkers. So I just found a whole bunch of K-cups and put them on every single faculty's door. You know, you're encouraged. Be, be something that it can be really simple. And they thought it was fantastic. They were like, you care. That chocolate got me through grading those final 100 essays. Uh, that cup of coffee, it was the thing I needed to get me through giving a million proctorio exams because it felt like what the semester was doing. So it could be something really simple to support that faith with a small action or deed. Um, and supporting faculty and staff through this time really knows that you care. I mean, you can say you care, but when you show your care, you show that you're listening to them and giving them time, 
sometimes it's worth to give more than giving them a raise because a lot of times we can't give them the raise, but to know they're appreciated and valued can go a whole lot further. Ask them, how's your family doing with COVID? How's your family doing in isolation? Uh, what does that look like for you and how can we be a support? And then finally, just be available. Uh, I have times on my calendar uh, that people can sign up for in my signature, in my email. It says schedule a meeting and they can see all the times that I have available. And I do just 10 minute and 15 minute meetings where if they need to call and just say, hey, I'm really struggling with this piece of technology or what do I do because all my grades disappeared? Where are they? <laughs> um, things that people panic over. <laughs> um, those types of things, it just helps to have that, have that button in my, all my emails and they can click on it and see all the times that I've set aside to be there for them. And it's not all day, every day, but there are times when they know I've set it aside for them as faculty members. And then I've, I'm sharing this resource. These are hyperlinked and Renee said they're gonna be um, shared after the video. Uh, I found a couple of pages, 100 encouraging verses, 100 encouraging prayers. So if you're not super creative, don't worry about it. Copy and paste, but make it personal. I think that's the biggest thing is just find something that you can do really easy. If you use Hootsuite or something like that, that you can set them up to go automatically out. That's another great tip. But I found that, that sharing verses with something personalized, offering to pray for a specific prayer um, has been really positive. Um, not only being a mentee, but being a mentor as a faculty, um, sometimes we forget the encouragement side and we, we're so focused on the academic side of getting things done. And we do, we need to get things done. I don't, I don't mean that, <laughs> but sometimes just having that encouragement along the way um, can be really super supportive. Uh, I think this year people in isolation have, in my experience, uh, needed the extra, what we would call extra hug, and we can't hug. So we do that through through prayer and through uh, sharing thankfulness that they're there, that they're a part of our team. Um, I know this probably sounds really hokey, but people need hokey right now. People need that support to feel like they can go on and really be encouraged to be a part of the process. Um, so I wanna spend some time, I would like for you to share your questions and feedback. Uh, I have two email addresses here. And then I also have created a Facebook page if anybody's interested. It's called the Christian Adult Higher Education Collaboration. And it's a place where um, we can share ideas, we can share scriptures, we can share things that are working. And if you're interested in that, just shoot me an email and I'll join you to that page in Facebook. I'll send you an invite um, because I always find curating the information you wanna send out is a lot easier when you can copy and paste <laughs> than having to go look for it yourself. <laughs> um, so if that's okay, I think I've taken just about uh, 30 minutes. I wanna have some collaboration time. I'm, if you know me, you know I like to share ideas. Um, so I see we have a hand. Go ahead, Cynthia. Hi, uh, Stacy. I kind of thought you were going to talk about um, the situation at Louisiana College. Now you've turned a corner, um, but I know that you've been that Louisiana College has been in a in a tough situation. Um, some of you know me. I'm I'm a Higher Learning Commission peer reviewer, and I get pulled in on these schools that are, are having really tough situations going on probation, regular, you know, ready to close. And um, I've been a participant at some of those schools as well. So communication is really important. I wanted to share something at one of the schools. Um, it's not a Christian college, so you don't know this school and I won't give it a name. But when they had to lay off, um, I think they had to lay off about uh, a third or a half of their faculty. The board of trustees pulled all the faculty together and had faculty input on a plan to, um, to lay off people. You know, they had to do it. And, and I thought that was brilliant because <laughs> my own school, Ohio Christian, a couple years ago, we had to lay off 
uh, approximately half of our faculty. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of wish we would have done that. It was a little unpractic impractical to do something like that, but um, I thought it was amazing that they brought that, that they had faculty input on it. Stacy, you want to talk about what happened at, and maybe you've not been at Louisiana College that long to know. I, I've only been here since January of last year. And oh. um, I know it's been five years under the new president and a lot happened five years ago um, when the last president uh, left. So there, there's still, I think, a lot of recovering, recouping going on right now. Um, but I don't have any specific instances other than what we've really been dealing with during COVID. And yeah, is Louisiana College recovering? Are you got... You don't really know. I will tell you, I should tell you after I told you about Ohio Christian, we have turned the corner and we prayed and prayed and prayed for a deliverance from the situation. And you know who our delivery deliverer was? The federal government and the COVID relief. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I mean, it wasn't what we were expecting at all. It isn't that the way Jesus is? Isn't that the way the Lord is? It's never what you, I, we were wanting a big donor, you know, and we didn't realize the big donor was the federal government and the CARES Act. Wow. Yeah. So um, Ohio Christian, just so y'all know, we, we've turned the corner and we're going to survive. It looks like. That's great to hear. That's a really good school. And I, I'm glad when I can hear other Christian schools that are turning the corner. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Do we have any other input or feedback that you guys would like to share? I just have a, a question for the group. And by the way, fantastic job, Stacy. Thanks. I appreciate your work so much. Um, yeah, kind of early on, you were talking about the author and, um, and how he said, um, to, it's important to communicate the organizational culture very frequently, and then um, when appropriate, to tweak that organizational culture too. I just kind of like to get your all's thoughts or hear your thoughts about a grassroots tweaking of the culture or a top down. And maybe Stacy, that author um, actually elaborated more on that. I don't know, but. I'm just kind of wanting to open that up to everybody and see what you think about that. Grassroots, top down, what are your thoughts? I think with COVID, it's opened a lot more of the grassroots um, organizational change than in the past, uh, just because people are trying to communicate differently on different levels. Uh, I think research, most research would say top down organizational change. Uh, but I think that research is changing. Um, I'd have to look specifically, but I think it's more, uh, I would call it like mid-level. Uh, you can really see organizational culture at what we call mid-level management or mid-level culture. Uh, but I'd be interested to hear what other schools or other people in the field would have to say about that. I think it's so important to have reassurances from um, the top. Um, reassurances that, um, you know, we're going to get through this and some positive um, things. Um, I think that's so, so important so that people don't lose heart. I agree with you. I think when the top gets silent, people get scared. That's been my experience. Stacey, I was just going to mention, I come from a communication background as well, like, like you. And one of the things, this isn't about the culture question, but one of the things when we were, you were talking about just this critical need for administrative communication and particularly being adjunct driven uh, in our programs uh, and particularly uh, professional studies or graduate programs, during this unprecedented crisis, you know, like you said, a precedented crisis, you anticipate, you've dealt with it before, you kind of know what needs, needs to happen. The big learning curve for us at Southern Nazarene was that 
Well, first of all, you're just scrambling for one thing. You know, you're pivoting to virtual at the last minute with people who have said to you specifically, I never want to teach online. And not only are they not teaching online, but they're they're the worst. It's it's they've got the flex schedule. Like, okay, some of your some of your students are zooming, some are um, in the classroom, and so they they even have the kind of the worst scenario. But here's what we found in the early days. Not so much now because we've tried to correct it. But last year during this unprecedented crisis, is that there was so much communication trying to go out that we needed a really crafted, critical, from the top and from the bottom, what needs to be said, to whom, how much. Our adjunct faculty were pulling their hair out. They were getting these long emails from two or three different places in the university. They did not know how to sift through it. Uh, something would go out and someone would say, well, did you send it to PGS? Or, oh, no, we didn't. So everyone's scrambling. So the thing that I think some of us have learned, I, I know myself, is that you have to be careful that, that you communicate, that you're crafting that. And this is just basic common sense too. But there was so much trying to be sure all our bases were covered that we literally, uh, they, our, our agent got inundated and almost, I think quit reading. So things that really needed to go out, critical information for them got lost in all of the emails and the long emails uh, in the one from the president, the one from the, the provost, the one from our VPAA, the one from a program director, our faculty director of faculty development. I mean, they were getting them from all over the place. And it's that, uh, it's kind of really having a crisis communication plan uh, in place for those, especially those unprecedented ones, because you're trying to cover almost too much and you're kind of frantic and covering it all in one email and it's just too much. And so we've kind of learned that we need to really have a plan in place that crafts that really well. And um, that's I, I just kind of a lesson learned. The program, and Ann and Delilah can speak to this. We were all trying to fill in the gaps for the things that weren't being told, talk faculty, adjunct faculty off the ledge because they were like going, what is going on and who are these people? We were having some change in structure so it was just a crazy time for communication. So it really is critical, like you said, to pull in people that can look at the hook, can step back and say, here's what you need to do. Here's a plan in place for those really crazy unprecedented crises, you know, or here's the place to start at least. So that's one of the lessons we learned in that process. Oh, that's, it's so true. And it's easy to look back with, with hindsight, but I'm hoping we, we use this to launch forward as well. Uh, how do we continue to communicate well? And like you said, the inundation of communication is, is just overwhelming, even for me. Uh, and I, I, I'm more of the admin role than, than faculty. But one of the ideas I heard and saw, uh, that we did it some here on campus, was uh, every week, every Monday, there is a scheduled newsletter that goes out. And you can only have so much information in your header. So the president has a header, the VPA has a header, student services has a header. And it's it's almost like, it's longer than a tweet. So it's not 140 characters, but it's no more than 140 words. And so just keeping that real concise, this is what you need to know. It goes out from one person every week, it's scheduled. Uh, I really love that approach, and we've tried to, to get that approach for our adjuncts as well. Give them some really concise, if they don't need to know what student service is doing, it doesn't impact them if they're online. So what do we really need to share with them? So I, I don't know if that'll help anybody. That might be something you want to think about doing, a, a short one-page email that has headers, really clear headers. Are you finding that your students aren't paying attention to emails? That's what we find. We're frustrated. We, we don't know how to get to our students. <laughs> what? We do. We found that um, 
we switched to Canvas uh, also in the middle of all of this. And Canvas does have global announcements and we found those to be pretty effective. Uh, we do know the students get them in the global announcement, they get them in their email, but we find it's more effective if we can have our faculty uh, kind of review that information with them while they're doing their classes. So if they, if they hear it in some other form, other than email. The email just kind of is the, the concrete foundation that supports the message that's going out across, across the system. Well, the, uh, the faculty use their email. So a message that you need to get to the faculty. And that's really important to keep your faculty encouraged because they lead the students. That They are the front lines on the students. So if the faculty get discouraged, it's going to move on to the students. Yeah. Yes, very quickly, very, very quickly. <laughs> That's why finals week, buy the biggest bag of candy you can. I mean, candy goes a long way <laughs> with helping faculty just say, okay, I can make it through. Uh, and, and I know that seems trivial, but it's, it's so, I mean, how reassuring is it is if somebody drops off some chocolate or just a power snack? I found these little kids looking to see if I have them, little tiny half-size granola bars um, for people that are looking for something, uh, or like I said, a K-cup just to have a drink. It, it goes a long way with feeling like somebody recognizes me. I'm here. And so because of COVID, we, we don't see each other, but I just went and nailed them to all their doors with thumbtacks. <laughs> we have cork boards and I just went and pegged them on all the doors uh, and or put them in their, their mailboxes. So I think something like that is encouraging to help them, but consistent communication, I think is key. And that's why I think sometimes I post verses uh, in my encourage, I have two, I'm running two pages right now on Facebook for encouragement and my faculty go, man, how did you know I was going through this today? I was like, I didn't, I posted that on Sunday and today's Thursday. It's just, God knows what you need if, if you have somebody that's willing to share that with you. And I think that's how God encourages our, you know, his people is, is through us, if we're willing to share that message of hope. And it encourages me to encourage other people um, because I'm reading that word, I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm marinating in it and sharing it. I feel like you give a gift, you get a gift. And I don't know, that, that's just my personality. Maybe some other people have some ideas. I know Andrew has a great sense of humor and, he probably has some ideas and ways to make people laugh. <laughs> Was that an invitation now to try to make people laugh? Let's see, I could put on some kind of a show. No, I, I think one of the other things that we've worked at trying to do at Moody too, uh, throughout all this has been sharing positive things. You know, I think our, everything we see is so full of negativity um, and there's plenty of negative stuff around, but. Uh, I've worked harder at just sharing some of the positive things, whether that's things that we see at Moody or things that we see students doing or things that, uh, you know, adjuncts who are still getting things published or those kind of things. And so in my weekly uh, letter that's not restricted to 140 words, although I'm going to think about that, um, you know, I, I think that that's been helpful just for people to see some of the positive things. I've also tried to curate uh, some more things that I see, you know, whether it's things from the Chronicle of Higher Ed or other things that are, again, just try to give people some hope and some ability to process it as well as that ability to say, oh, we're not all alone in this. Other people are struggling with this too. And not just that misery loves company, but I think that that's been beneficial for people to get a bigger picture so that they don't just get so myopic in their focus on, man, this is awful for me in my class, um, but that they're able to see, oh, this is part of a bigger issue. So that's been good. Uh, two. I have not shared dad jokes with them every week, though, but, you know. Come on, those are the best. No, no, no what is the best is watching my sons share dad jokes with with their kids, so that's, that's oh. when I know that I've arrived with my humors that my kids are passing that on to my grandkids, so. That's great. I love curating the, the positive stories that you have from your students. Uh, and sharing those. I think that's such a wonderful idea to um, create some positive news. And like you said, we're not alone. There is a, another Facebook website that, uh, webpage that I follow, uh, Inside Higher Ed, I think is who sponsors it. 
And one of their things that really helped me this semester is um, 10 ways to get people to show up to a webinar appropriately. And the first one was, please wear clothes. And I was like, that's a good one. <laughs> the second one was like, please make sure people that walk behind you are wearing clothes. Like it was just this redundancy of, and I was like, you know, that's so true because I hear from faculty, I uh, saw things I shouldn't see and, and this is on Proctorio or this is on the webinar. How do I, how do I do this? And so it was a way to kind of start a conversation of what would you make your 10 things uh, for your students on how to show up and, and how to engage. Um, I have one, I've read one story where everybody introduces their pet the first class meeting, because they're gonna show up in the screen, they're gonna bark, they're gonna meow, they're gonna, so the first the first day is get to know you and your pet, because it, that's what's at home, that's what's in your space. Um, I think some of, some of